fact that this is the time of year when most of the Christian world is thinking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They pay a lot of attention to that, and with good reason. For it's truly one of the greatest events that's ever occurred. In fact, several years ago, a noted historian was asked if he would to list what he considered to be the greatest events in all of human history. And number one on his list, he says, was the birth of Christ. And just stop and think about that. Uh, God making the decision to take on human flesh and come and dwell among His creation. Perhaps nothing greater in all of life could have been done or manifested than when God chose that time to come and dwell among us. Number two on his list, he says, was the death of Christ. And again, that which many people would think of as a great tragedy was in reality for us a great blessing. Because finally, a perfect sacrifice was being offered up unto God that could really take away the sins of the world. All of the thousands of millions of animals that had been sacrificed and all that blood was spilt could not take away a single solitary sin. But now a sacrifice has been made when God gave His own Son to die for us, whereby every sin that has ever been committed or ever will be committed can and will be taken away when people act in obedience to the will of God. Number three on his list was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you've got to recognize just how important that is. The resurrection of Christ is the evidence that God has given to us that Jesus Christ is His Son. When Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, Paul said of Christ that He was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection was the proof that God's given to all mankind that we can know absolutely that Jesus Christ is His Son. But more than that, the resurrection of Christ is also the guarantee that you and I have that the sacrifice that Christ made for our sins was accepted by God. You know, there were times in life when sacrifices were made that were unacceptable to God. You go all the way back to the very beginning with the two sons of Adam and Eve when they're making their sacrifices to God. God accepted the sacrifice of Abel and rejected the sacrifice of his brother Cain. And he did so because Cain had not done what God told him to do. But the sacrifice that Christ made was acceptable to God, and that meant then that God could and would remove sins. And so his resurrection is extremely important to those of us who are Christians, to those who are trusting in God. Without the resurrection of Christ, everything that you and I believe in and hope for would be totally destroyed. And that's why the resurrection is so important. And that may be also why so many of the enemies of Christ have done the best they could to destroy people's faith in the resurrection of Christ, to deny that it ever happened. If one visits the land of Palestine today, you will be shown, if you take those tours, you'll be shown a tomb that they say was the very tomb in which Christ was buried. I don't know how in the world you could ever go about proving something like that. But as one brother pointed out one time, you know, that tomb did meet the three basic criteria for being the tomb of Christ. Number one, it was a tomb located in a garden. And in the book of John, the 19th chapter, about verse 41, the Bible tells us that when Jesus was crucified, where He was crucified was near a garden. And in the garden there was a tomb in which no man had ever been laid. It was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the tomb where Christ would be buried. And so it meets that criteria. It was located in a garden. The second thing is, it was a tomb that had been hewn out of solid rock. And that had been the case also with the tomb where Christ was buried, according to Matthew chapter 27 and verse 60. It was hewn out of solid rock. But there was a third criteria also that had to be met. And that was that that tomb was empty. The tomb where Christ was buried is a tomb that was emptied. How do you explain that? How can you explain that empty tomb? On Friday, it had been filled with the body of Christ, but on Sunday morning, it was empty. And there has to be some reason for that. And as I said, the enemies of Christ have gone to great lengths 
trying to prove that Christ was not resurrected from the dead. If they can prove that, then Christianity is destroyed. And like I said, everything you and I believe in and hope for would be destroyed along with it. One of the things they had done was to claim that the disciples of Christ are the ones who had stolen the body of Christ away from that tomb. Now just stop and think about that for a moment. Why in the world would his disciples have done something like that? Well, the enemy would say, well, they did that because that leaves the tomb empty and then they can claim to everybody that Jesus Christ has been resurrected from the dead. And that's why they did it, to offer some reason of hope to these people to explain that. In fact, that explanation is the oldest one that's ever been given. It was an explanation that was given by the soldiers who had been put there to guard the tomb to prevent the disciples from doing that very thing. In fact, the Bible tells us in Matthew 28 and verse 13 that these soldiers were given a large sum of money and were told to tell the people that his disciples came and stole away the body while we were asleep. Now stop and think about that for just a moment. Suppose someone broke into your house and they stole every valuable thing you had in that house. And you call the police the next morning and you tell them what's happening. List all the things that have been stolen. And then you tell them, I know who did it. And you give them a person's name. But you've already told them. This person came in and robbed me of everything I had while I and my family were asleep. If you were asleep, how do you know what happened? If you were asleep, how do you know who came into your house and took away everything you own? If these soldiers were asleep, how do they know what happened to the body of Christ? If they were asleep, they would not have known. This is a lie. But somebody said, well, why in the world would these soldiers lie about it? I mean, in doing that, they're putting their own lives in danger. You remember in, in the book of Acts, chapter 12, when Peter and James had been arrested, and James was put to death by the sword, evidently beheaded, and Peter was put in prison with the intent by Herod to bring him out of prison when the Sabbath was passed, and to put him to death. But while he is in prison, an angel comes in. Peter is chained between two guards and their other guards outside. And the angel comes in and he wakes Peter up. He has to hit him to wake him up. And when Peter stands up, his chains fall off of him. And the angel leads him out past the other guards. And the gate, the outside, opens by itself so he can go out. And for the longest, Peter thought he was dreaming. But suddenly he realized what had happened. And he goes and reports, he goes to the home of Mary to let the disciples know that he's been freed. Meantime, the next morning, Herod sends to have Peter brought out to be executed. They go and they find the prison as it was. The guards are still stationed there and everything. The doors are locked, but Peter's not there. So Herod immediately had a search made throughout to find Peter, and they couldn't find him. And then he went in and he examined the guards. And when he was through examining them, he had them put to death. Why? Because there was a Roman law that said if a guard allowed a prisoner to escape, then that guard would suffer whatever punishment that prisoner was to expect. And since they had intended on killing Peter, they decided then these guards let him go. They're to be the ones to be put to death. So why in the world would these guards who are there guarding the tomb of Jesus, why would they lie about it and admit that the disciples had stolen the body away while they were on guard duty. Wouldn't that mean their own death? Why would they do it? Well, the reason they did it, two different reasons that are given to them. Number one, the text says that they were paid a large sum of money. The priests and the elders of the Jews came to them and told them, you tell this lie, you tell the people that while you were asleep, his disciples came and stole the body. And, and they paid them that large sum of money. And they said, if anything about this comes to the ear of the governor. If he hears about it so that your life is in danger, we'll take care of the matters for you. We'll see to it that no harm comes to you, that you will be saved. 
And so that's why they did it, for the money and the assurance that they would be safe in doing that. But again, why would the disciples steal away the body of Christ? If they did that, then those disciples would have known absolutely that what they were teaching and what they were preaching was a lie. Would those disciples have been willing to put their own lives in danger for something that they knew was a lie? Consider about when Jesus was first arrested and taken away. What was the reaction of the disciples? Well, according to Mark chapter 14, about verse 50, the text says they all forsook him and fled. Why did they do that? They were terrified for their own lives. Later we learned there were two disciples that did follow Jesus, Peter and John. John was known by the people there, and so he was allowed to go on into the praetorium where Christ was carried. Peter stood outside, warming himself by the fire. And not once, but three different times, when Peter is accused of being one of his disciples, Peter denied it. The last time, swearing and taking an oath that he knew not the man. Why did he do that? Because Peter was terrified, afraid that he would be identified with Christ, and he would have to forfeit his own life. And he didn't want to die, and because of his fear, he said nothing about it. You see, the disciples, when Jesus was put to death, had lost their hope. You remember the two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus? When Jesus comes after his resurrection, and he joins them, and he questions them about the fact that their countenance is fallen and the conversation they're having. And they said, are you a stranger in Jerusalem and do not know what happened there? And Jesus said, what things? And they explained to him about how Christ had been taken and put to death. And they said, this is the third day since that happened. And then they added, and we had hoped that it was he who would deliver Israel. Did you hear that? We had hope, past tense. They no longer were saying we hope in him. Because that hope is gone because he's been put to death. But now later, we see these disciples believing in Christ again. Having that hope restored. And we have people like Peter who is willing to even be put to death as Christ had prophesied he would by crucifixion. He's no longer afraid of death. He's no longer afraid of that Sanhedrin that had condemned Christ. He stood before them himself. And he defied them and pointing out that we ought to obey God rather than men. Where did Peter get that kind of courage all of a sudden? What changed? What changed was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter said, we've got a new hope, a living hope. Peter, how'd you get that? It's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those disciples were no longer afraid of death, no longer afraid of the Sanhedrin or any of the enemies of the church because they knew that Jesus had been risen from the dead. Now, it's possible that a person may die for what he believes is the truth. But he will not die for what he knows is a lie. The fact that these disciples were willing to die for Christ is evidence of the fact that they were convinced that he really had been raised from the dead. So they knew they had not taken that body. So how do you explain then this empty tomb? Well, a second explanation that men have come up with, it's even more ridiculous. You're going to have to advance that for me. It's not wanting to go. Uh, that the enemies of Christ stole away his body. Now, if you think like I do, that that first excuse, that first reason they gave him was simply stupid, then what about this? To claim that his body has been stolen by his enemies. Question, why did the enemies request of Pilate that there be a guard placed at the tomb of Jesus to keep it from being opened and the body being taken out? They did it because they understood Jesus had prophesied His resurrection, and we don't want His disciples coming and stealing it and causing the people to believe that He's been resurrected. We don't want that to happen. We don't want them to believe. And so we want them to understand 
that that body's not been taken out. That's why we've asked this guard to be put there. So why in the world would the enemies of Christ, who are trying to stop the people from believing in a resurrection, why would they do the very thing that would cost those people to believe that a resurrection had taken place? That doesn't make sense at all, does it? Furthermore, if the enemies are the one who had stolen the body of Christ out of that tomb, why didn't they go take the body of Christ and bring it out and say, no, he hasn't risen from the dead. Here's his body. That would have proven once for all time that Jesus Christ was not resurrected, that he wasn't who he claimed to be. He wasn't the Messiah. He wasn't the Son of God. And that would have destroyed the belief that people had in him. But they didn't do that because they didn't have the body. They had not taken the body of Christ. Then how do you explain then this empty tomb? A third reason that's given is that those that claim the disciples simply went to the wrong tomb. Now there's a sense in which I can kind of understand that. Uh, especially in light of, of cemeteries today. You go out to a cemetery and there are hundreds or thousands of, of people buried there. And it's difficult to go and find a, a particular grave site. My parents are buried there in Woodlawn, there at the Forest Hill Cemetery. And I remember sometime after the burial, I'd gone by the grave site. I spent a lot of time looking, and I couldn't find it. And I thought, with all those little winding roads in there, I must have taken the wrong one somehow. And, and I'd spent time with unable to find it. I had to wait later and go back and, and request their, where their graveside is and how to get to it. And so I thought, well, I can see maybe if somebody would go to the wrong graveside. And then plus, you think about the fact that the ones who went to the tomb of Christ first and found it empty were the women. Uh, and these disciples, like all of them, were filled with grief. And sometimes when we're overcome with grief, we're just not able to function properly. And, and maybe they could have gone to the wrong graveside. And remember, they went to that graveside as it was dawning toward the first day of the week. So it's not full light yet. It's still partial darkness. And, and maybe they made a mistake because of that. And they, they simply went to the wrong tomb. So maybe that could have happened. But you've got to understand, the cemeteries there were not like the public cemeteries that we're familiar with today. This was a, a small place, and it was a private tomb. It was one that had been built by a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. It wasn't out there with the masses of people. And if, if those women went to the wrong tomb, is it possible that Peter and John, who came next, would have made the same mistake? They weren't led by the women out to the tomb they'd gone to. They went on their own. Would they have made the same mistake? And if they had, would Joseph of Arimathea made the same mistake? Would he have not have known that this is not my tomb, this is not where we laid Christ? That he could have told them that? And what about the fact that when Peter and John came to that tomb, they ran to the tomb, and evidently John being younger, outran Peter and he got there first. And when he got there, the Bible says that stooping down and looking into the tomb... He saw the burial clothes. And then Peter came in. Being the kind of person he is, he didn't stop. He went on inside. And the Bible says when he got there to the inside there of the tomb, that he saw the burial clothes that had been on Christ. Plus, in addition to that, there was the handkerchief that had been over the face of Jesus, found it folded and put away in a different place. The burial clothes there is evidence that someone had been buried there. It was not just an empty tomb. And that's evidence that they've gone to the right tomb. It's where Christ had been buried. But it's simply, he's no longer there. And so that would be evidence that they went to the right tomb. But if, if it is case that all of these people simply went to the wrong tomb, why then did not the enemy ever suggest Follow us. We'll lead you to the right tomb and show you that Christ is still there. They never did that because they knew that the disciples had gone to the right tomb. And they knew why it was empty. The fourth reason that has been suggested 
It's what's been called the swoon theory. This is a theory that was developed by a man by the name of H.E.G. Paulus back in 1828. He was a German uh, philosopher and theologian, but he was a man who, who worked a great deal to find mistakes in the Bible. And this, he thought, was one of them. And so he came up with the idea that when Jesus was on the cross because of the severe pain he was under and, and all that had been forced upon him, he simply passed out while there on the cross. He swooned. And when the centurion saw it, he thought Jesus was dead. And so he gave him permission to take the body down. They took his body down, they put it in the tomb, and sometime later in the coolness of that tomb, he revived. And he got out, got up and came out, and everybody thought he's been raised from the dead. But if the infidel has a hard time in believing the resurrection of Christ, as a believer, I have a far harder time believing the swoon theory. Because, just stop and remember now what's happened to Jesus. Number one, after his arrest and trial, he goes, undergoes scourging. Uh, the beating that was ministered to them by those Roman soldiers. We talked about it before. It was sometimes referred to as the Roman half-death because it was so brutal. And there were times when people died under the lash of the scourge. There was a centurion there watching all of this, and he was giving his opinion as to when enough is enough. We don't want to do any more lest we kill him. And so he stopped after that beating, and he's forced to carry his cross to the place of crucifixion. But he's not able to, to get that far with it. He collapses under it, and they force another man, Simon of Cyrene, to bear the cross of Christ. And when they get there, they nail him to that cross, and he's on that cross for six hours. And after six hours, he dies, and he's put into that tomb. And sometimes later, he revives. Now think about this. First of all, the soldiers who know death, they have already acknowledged that Jesus was dead. Pilate refuses to release the body of Jesus to Joseph of Arimathea until he's talked first of all with the centurion to know whether or not Jesus has really, been, has really died. And the centurion assures Pilate that he's dead, and so he releases the body. And he's buried. Now, according to the swoon theory, what's happened? All right. He revives in the coolness of that tomb. And when he revives, he takes off the burial clothes. Do you realize that removal of the burial clothes would require help of someone else? You remember when Lazarus died and Jesus comes up there and Jesus calls out, Lazarus, come forth. They've opened the tomb already, come forth. And the dead comes forth from the tomb. What did Jesus then tell them? Unloose him and let him go. He was still bound up in his burial clothes and it took other people to unloose him and set him free. But according to this, Jesus managed somehow or another to free himself from those burial clothes. And then of all things, he rolls away the stone. When the women came to the tomb to, for the purpose of, of anointing Christ's body, they were wondering who's going to roll away the stone for us. Because they couldn't do it by themselves. It would take several men to roll that stone away. And, and when that stone was put in place, it was placed into a little gully there, so it would sit there. It would take more strength to roll it out of that than it took to put it in there. But Jesus is on the inside of the tomb. There's no way he can grab hold to that stone in any way to move it. All he could do is put his hands on it and try to give enough pressure on it and then push it to move Couldn't do that. But they say that's what he did. He came forth. This man who has spent six hours on the cross, been beaten, and has had his side pierced so that blood has come out freely from it. And physiologists tell us that that in itself is an indication that Christ was dead. In all likelihood that his heart itself had ruptured under all that he had gone through. And yet with that, he gets out of that tomb. He gets that stone out of the way. He overcomes the Roman soldiers who had been placed there. And then he walks a distance of approximately 55 miles on feet that have been pierced by nails. And when he gets to Galilee, where he's gone to meet his disciples, he convinces them he's overcome death. I tell you, 
that's a greater miracle to believe than just trusting in the resurrection. It never could have happened. So how do you account for the empty tomb? Well, there's one less thing, or one more thing I should say, that we could say about that as to why that tomb is empty. And it's, it's a theory that comes to us not as a theory, not as something that comes from some theologian, but it came from two men, two men in shining apparel who spoke to the women and said to them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but risen. There's the answer for the empty tomb. God Almighty raised up His Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. And because Christ has been raised from the dead, we know He is the Son of God. We know His sacrifice for our sins has been acceptable to God, and our sins can be removed. The only question now we have to ask is, have I been obedient to God that by the power of His Son, Christ, and His sacrifice have my sins forgiven? Have I come to that point of faith in Jesus that I've repented of my sins, confessed Him before men, and I've been buried with Him in baptism to have my past sins washed away? And if I've done that, have I continued living faithfully to Him that I might continue to be cleansed by that blood? If not, what better day in all of life to do that than right now on the Lord's day to make that decision to obey Him and do so because you know from all the evidence that He is the one that's been raised from the dead that we might be redeemed. If you're subject to His invitation, we encourage you to respond in obedience to His will while together we stand and while we sing.